Thank you, Member. Member for Vancouver Fairview. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Well, if, um, if this chamber was uh, a class in, uh, in drama, I guess we'd be calling what's happened uh, over the last few days with the introduction of this bill the denouement. Um, I don't know if over the, uh, the last 18 months to two years, what we've been witnessing is uh, an exercise in monomania or a Greek tragedy. Honorable Speaker, what we've seen, what we've seen in the months leading up to the election was a premier, a government, and candidates who were almost obsessed with the promise of LNG, obsessed to the point of pumping it up to great heights, of hyping it in the greatest of terms. Honorable Speaker, the reason I referenced a Greek tragedy is we often see in Greek tragedies the central characters riding on top of the world, creating a fantasy about everything good that has happened and will happen in the future. And as events unfold, Honorable Speaker, they are brought crashing down to earth, often with a very heavy thud, often with very tragic circumstances. And what we see with this bill, Honorable Speaker, after months and months of hype, after months and months of talk about great return, paying off the province's debt through a prosperity fund, elimination of the provincial sales tax, trillions of dollars in income, hundreds of thousands of jobs, we now see speakers on the other side in support of this bill dealing with the reality that this tax bill demonstrates, dealing with the reality of what the real return to the province of BC may be. And it is not that that return will be nothing, Honourable Speaker. That's not what I or any of my colleagues are claiming. But what it will be if some of these proposals go forward, if one or two of them go forward, as many commentators on the industry believe is the likely outcome, we will see a piece of BC's economy, a promising piece of BC's economy, a piece of BC economy that if we do it right, with a number of conditions, will benefit some British Columbians, but it will not be, Honourable Speaker, the one single industry that takes care of all of BC's problems. Honourable Speaker, I've listened to some of the speakers opposite, some of the members opposite, and I have watched over several months, over a year, as members opposite have been loyal, uh, loyal spokespeople following the Premier's overhyped dreams, overhyped announcements, announcements that, let me say, from day one, critics, commentators in the media, knowledgeable people about the industry, warned. Warned were inflated. Warned were not grounded in reality. Warned were not taking account of the natural give and take of the market and the state of energy markets in Asia and other places in the world. Warned that it wasn't useful, Honourable Speaker, to carry on with such hyperbole. But yet, every time the subject of LNG comes up in this chamber, Honourable Speaker, we listen and we hear speakers opposite repeat promises that virtually everybody knowledgeable in the industry understands are outlandish, but more importantly, that people in the industry believe are not useful to them, are not useful to them, Honourable Speaker, in establishing a viable LNG extraction and manufacturing industry in British Columbia. Honourable Speaker, I, uh, I listened uh, just now to the, the member from Shuswap uh, commenting on statements that have been made in this house, this side of the house, believing that it wasn't clear what we believed in, believing that we were demonstrating inconsistency. And Honourable Speaker, all I can say is that the member opposite mistakes rationality and common sense for inconsistency. 
Yes, we are inconsistent with the hyperbole we've experienced from the Premier and members opposite, but we are not inconsistent with many knowledgeable commentators on this industry or inconsistent with many people who wish and desire and have a stake in this industry going forward. What we are, Honourable Speaker, is rational. What we want to do, Honourable Speaker, and what we've said in four conditions that we've laid out for an LNG industry is that we believe that the industry, as part of a suite of industries in British Columbia, holds part of the puzzle to our economic future, but that it has to be done in certain ways, under certain conditions, conditions that are real, conditions that are grounded in actions that make them real, conditions, for instance, that actually put forward express guarantees of jobs for British Columbians and training for British Columbians so that they are able to take those jobs, that we need to get a fair return for our resource, Honourable Speaker, that we shouldn't be giving it away and that the terms of the return for the resource should be transparent and easily understood by all British Columbians. And of course, Honourable Speaker, that the industry includes real and tangible benefits for First Nations as well as respects First Nations inherent rights, constitutional rights, rights that have been recently confirmed by the Supreme Court of Canada and make it absolutely clear that nothing can really proceed in terms of resource extraction and development that impinges on First Nations uh, rights and title that is yet to be settled without genuine consultation and genuine accommodation. And finally, Honourable Speaker, we have said that it's not good enough to talk about having the cleanest LNG industry in the world. It's not good enough to pretend that because we may export LNG to an area that is using coal, that this will somehow replace and transplant the greenhouse gas emissions that are being produced currently in those jurisdictions, or even necessarily that uh, we're replacing greenhouse gas emissions that might be part of those countries' future. That may be true, that may not be true, we simply don't know and there are no conditions attached to this industry by the government that would see this be true. And what we have also said, Honourable Speaker, is that real strong environmental standards, as mentioned by the member from Shuswap, that we would have the cleanest LNG in the world, the cleanest LNG facilities in the world, and the highest environmental standards can't simply be a statement. It has to be accompanied by a plan, a plan that shows British Columbians how this government intends to meet the greenhouse gas emission targets that are contained in this government's own legislated commitments for British Columbia, because we cannot pretend this industry will not produce greenhouse gas emissions or that they'll only produce greenhouse gas emissions at the liquefaction plant, we know there are emissions all the way from the extraction in the fields, in the gas fields, all the way down the pipeline. Honourable Speaker, it is incredibly important that we be honest about this industry and that we show what the steps we will take to guarantee that we not only have the cleanest LNG liquefaction, which won't simply happen, because the government sets a benchmark and requires the purchase of offsets. It will happen when we introduce measures that reduce emissions and we specify where else in our economy, in our industry, and in our day-to-day -day habits we are going to reduce emissions to compensate for new ones that are being produced. Honourable Speaker, the member from Shuswap touted this tax regime in this legislation as meeting the realities of the market and providing proponents with certainty and clarity. And it may well do that. It may well provide certainty and clarity. Certainly, we now know, after months of living with announcements by the uh, finance minister in a February budget that talked about a nominal uh, tax rate of 7% once the capital investments were paid off, we now see that that 
is 3.5%. Honorable Speaker, that's a significant cut, which means there's a significant cut and drop in the expectations of British Columbians about what that tax rate and the royalties can support in terms of the future of British Columbia and meeting the promises, the extravagant promises, the overhyped promises, the constantly repeated promises of the Premier of the province to eliminate the debt, to create 100,000 plus jobs, to create a prosperity fund to potentially eliminate uh, the provincial sales tax. We now know, Honourable Speaker, that that is virtually impossible. But the member from Shuswap may likely be right in that this tax structure, this royalty structure, is more in line with what the industry itself believes is necessary in order to make a profit on this industry. But, Honourable Speaker, the realities of the market didn't just pop up yesterday. They have been apparent for a long, long, long time. Honourable Speaker, in a few minutes I will read some examples of warnings that were sounded early in 2012 and early 2013 in response to uh, the hyperbole of the Premier that sounded caution. But did the government listen to it? Did the minister responsible for natural gas listen to it? Did the Premier listen to it? No. They charged ahead with claims that are not supported by the realities of this bill or of the other bill that we are still uh, debating in committee stage with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. They are not supported by the reality of what has been brought forward here today. Honourable Speaker, we've seen the tax rate cut in half. We see some potential major loopholes. We see all of this in a context of a major hyping, a major hyping of the possibilities of LNG that showed the proponents who are shrewd negotiators that this government was putting all of its eggs in this one liquefied natural gas basket. Honourable Speaker, as you know, one never wants to appear to have only one possible good outcome in negotiations because that prejudices you in negotiations. It weakens you in negotiations and it strengthens the hand of the people you're negotiating with. So what we have here today is a reduced tax rate. And let me talk a little bit about the Prosperity Fund, Honourable Speaker. It's interesting to note that when one of my colleagues from Columbia River Revelstoke did a search on the internet to find out how many times the finance minister had talked about the Prosperity Fund. And he did this, Honourable Speaker, because it was notable in the throne speech that nobody was talking about it anymore, that you can't actually find the finance minister referring to the Prosperity Fund. Honourable Speaker, the finance minister left the House somewhat disappointed that he he couldn't remain for uh, praise from one of my colleagues about uh, his responsible approach to a prosperity fund that we now know will never exist. The reason, I assume, Honourable Speaker, is notwithstanding his role as a senior member of the government, the finance minister feels some responsibility to have credibility on financial matters and to hold forth the opinion that this industry, which has yet to be created with a tax regime that was yet to be put in place, with enough loopholes in the tax regime to allow royalties to be offset by corporate income tax cuts at a later date going into the future, that it's just irresponsible to talk about a fund that we will, in all likelihood, never see. Honourable Speaker, if this government at some point in the future finds a way to create a prosperity fund out of thin air, I suppose I'll have to eat these words, but I feel fairly safe making them. And I believe that the finance minister was very careful in some of his statements, at least, to maintain some shreds of credibility as he proceeds with the budgeting process and other processes for which he is responsible. Honourable Speaker, let me simply quote 
uh, the columnist for the Vancouver Sun, Vaughn Palmer, who went pointing out that references to the Prosperity Fund had fallen off the table, that perhaps the Prosperity Fund was, quote, not dead, just resting. Honorable Speaker, that fund may be resting for a very, very, very long time. Honorable Speaker, it's hard to imagine how this particular tax regime, as well as the fact that until the capital construction costs have been paid off, the tax regime is even lower than the half of 7 or 3.5, it's 1.5. And Honorable Speaker, going into the future, I think we know that some of the, uh, the money that is paid in the 1.5, so the government gets some income, it needs to have some income to show that their claims weren't completely divorced from reality or completely outlandish. In the future, once the proponents build a plant and go up to the 3.5% tax rate, they will be able to, if I understand this tax structure correctly, and I believe that I do, deduct from, uh, from tax payments owing the taxes that they already paid to make a down payment in order so presumably um, the Liberal government has something to talk about in the next election campaign. Honourable Speaker, the member from Shuswap, the minister responsible for natural gas, the finance minister, even the premier have recently said, well, we only said the tax would be up to 7%. It's been hard negotiations. We need to enable this industry to be put into place. We need to enable it to get started. And they cited, quote unquote, changing economic conditions as the reason that some proponents are putting uh, their plans on hold. Some have stepped away. The tax regime has uh, changed. Global LNG prices have declined, they've said to us. There is more supply due to competition, they've said to us. There's the potential for rising construction costs. Honorable Speaker, nothing in any of this should be a surprise to the government. It certainly won't be a surprise to the energy companies, the energy experts, the media commentators, and the proponents who warned for a very long time that the claims of the government were somewhat inflated, that there were a number of cautions that we should all pay attention to as we sought to start this industry. Honourable Speaker, uh, in September 2012, two years ago, Macquarie Bank wrote a report in which it doubted that even four LNG plants would be built in BC, even though it did predict that BC would become an LNG exporter of some size by 2020. They pointed to delays, to cost overruns, and to emerging markets as real threats that could undermine the economics of the project. In February 2013, Honourable Speaker, I referred to the uh, the claim of the government and the Premier that uh, there would be a prosperity fund and there would be over 100,000 jobs. This was based on a report by Grant Thornton. Focus magazine said that Grant Thornton used a flawed methodology that produced a 15-fold overestimation of jobs. Honourable Speaker, they questioned Grant Thornton's econometric model and where, where uh, that model produced an estimate of 30 indirect and induced jobs for each assumed direct job, the U.S. House of Representatives Bipartisan Natural Gas Caucus estimated a far smaller three and a half indirect and induced jobs for every direct job in the U.S. gas industry. But Honorable Speaker, the Premier, for reasons known to her but assumed by many of us to have something to do with the attractiveness of making a 100,000 job promise during an election campaign ignored the reality and took comfort in the hype. Took comfort in the hype that she would repeat over and over and over and over again. 
Honorable Speaker, in April 2013, just before the election, at an LNG conference in Vancouver, global energy experts doubted the credibility of the Premier's optimism. They said that Asian buyers won't be paying the windfall prices that have been in place since Japan shut down 48 of its 50 nuclear power stations after the Fukushima disaster. They said that Asian buyers will seek to decouple the price of gas from the price of oil, and that BC will face stiff competition over prices with new supply coming from Africa, the US, and Australia. In May of 2013, the month of the election, Citigroup warned that we will face increased supply competition after the US Department of Energy approved 26 LNG export facility applications in Texas. In October 2013, after the election, the Canada West Foundation wrote a report titled Managing Expectations. Managing Expectations, Honourable Speaker, words that apparently the Premier of this province refuses to live by. Managing Expectations Assessing BC's LNG Industry. This report said that Asia may soon have more than enough natural gas of its own, and BC will face competition from domestic production in China and from pipeline imports to China. The minister responsible for natural gas responded to the report by saying, I don't mind being accused of being an optimist. Honorable Speaker, what British Columbians expect and deserve is a minister of finance, a minister responsible for natural gas, and possibly, possibly even a premier who say, we don't mind being labeled realists. Realists, not optimists who live on hype, honorable speaker, and build up hopes and expectations that can't possibly be met by this government or this industry. Honorable Speaker, in December 2013, we saw a meeting of the Asian Buyers Club that talked about how they were going to get a better deal and what was the response of this government? That it was a seller's market. Honorable Speaker, I don't know what a seller's market is when you have a glut of a product, but those two things defy the logic and the laws of economy a defiance that appears to have gone right over the head of the minister responsible for natural gas and some of the members on the opposite side who have great taking great pleasure in heckling. Honourable Speaker, I want to say yes to many things, and I will say yes to many things. I just wish that the government would say yes to a complete suite, to a complete suite of economic opportunities for British Columbia, not only, Honourable Speaker, not only, Honourable Speaker, the potential of a carefully thought out and developed natural gas industry. Honourable, Honourable Speaker, notwithstanding the Members. din in the House from people who are raising an issue that I'm not actually talking about and isn't a subject of this bill, Honourable Speaker, let's talk about what developing a responsible natural gas and liquefied natural gas industry in BC looks like in a context of a diverse and modern economy. Because, Honourable Speaker, people involved in the business community around British Columbia have been expressing concern for a very, very long time now about this government's narrow focus on one industry that does not yet exist. Honourable Speaker, it is a good thing to have aspirations to create a new industry if it's done responsibly, if it's done honestly, and if it's done with real environmental standards and greenhouse gas emission standards that are accompanied by a real plan, not a lot of rhetoric, not a lot of hot air, and not a lot of reliance on offsets that have yet to be defined. Honourable Speaker, let me close my remarks in the few minutes that I have left by talking about some of the existing BC industries that already have 
more than or close to 100,000 jobs that have great potential to continue grow, growing, that are doing well, but that could do better with a fraction of the attention that this government has placed on LNG and a fraction of the taxpayer-funded support that is being offered to the LNG industry. Honorable Speaker, recently the BC Technology Industry Association issued a report card on the industry. This industry is tremendously uh, successful. It currently has about 84,000 jobs. The pay in which average over $75,000 a year, which is 60% higher than the provincial average. Second only to construction in this province in jobs and creating more jobs in BC since 2012 than mining, forestry, and oil and gas combined. These include companies like Avigilon, Build Direct, Global Relay, Hootsuite, Vision Critical, and Westport. Honorable Speaker, the report card gives this industry an A, but when it compares this industry globally and with other pro provincial tech sectors in Canada, it is only a C plus. Now, members opposite may take some comfort in the fact that the C plus is an improvement from the C of last year's report card, but let me simply quote the CEO of the Canadian Venture Capital Private Equity Association, Mike Woollett. He says, governments have a role to play in everything from procurement initiatives, tax policies, and procurement policies while Canadian governments, including this government, only looks at cost on procurement. Honourable Speaker, this is an industry that can and should grow. This is an industry that has repeatedly made presentations to government, and while being appreciative for the support that has come from government so far, also believe that with nominal investment and a little bit of a commitment in four areas, the industry could do much better, and that if those investments are made, instead of a drop in GDP and jobs over the next five to 10 years, we will see a significant increase in contribution to GDP, a significant increase in jobs, and most importantly, a greater return to the people of the province in tax revenues than the expenditures being called for. And the actions are simple. The government could invest in talent, in developing talent, in attracting talent, in retaining talent. Instead, Honourable Speaker, we are woefully behind on a per capita basis in BC in graduating people in engineering, in math, in computer and info sciences, and we also lag in patents filed and granted on a per capita basis as well as absolute terms. Honourable Speaker, we could do better this is an industry that exists today, that's growing today, that has roots today, compared to an LNG industry that holds promise but does not yet exist. BCTIA also urged the government to set an example and give the tech industries in BC a home team advantage by encouraging government and business to buy BC tech. They also said it could revitalize venture capital in this sector and by doing so would encourage more private sector investment. And finally, Honourable Speaker, they said that if the government expanded some of the existing initiatives, the accelerator programs, the tech hubs, the mentorship programs like the Centre for Growth, that would help BC's technology industry grow from the small and medium businesses that predominate now to include larger companies with over 400 employees that can serve as anchors to build this sector. Honourable Speaker, Noting the hour this member. is just uh, one example of how BC can do better in an existing industry. We can do better. We can build new industries, but 
we can do much more than be focused on one industry only when we have existing successes. Honourable Speaker, with that I conclude my remarks and noting the hour, move that the House now adjourn. Move adjournment of the debate. I stand correct. Yes, move adjournment of the debate.